I'm Yellow Animal, and um, I have I am uh, primarily the head of the technical unit here at SGO, mm -hmm. and uh, the technical unit uh, is responsible for building and maintaining uh, the measurement network of SGO that mm -hmm. uh, has several uh, instruments and uh, measuring sites all over Finland and all, all over the globe, mm -hmm. and uh, in the future in, in space as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, also in particular, I am uh, leading the satellite project here at, at SGO. This is a facility where we uh, build and will build satellites and space instruments. Yeah, but now it's not clean and ready. Uh, because... At the moment, uh, it's being taken down because uh, it's a brand new facility and uh, we needed to do more work there. So uh, more construction work needed to be done. So for the time being, uh, it's not operational, mm. but it will be operational uh, quite soon, I, within weeks, I believe. Yeah. And your satellite, which is kind of ready, uh, it was uh, building here or in somewhere else? Uh, the, the satellite platform that we are using is, is commercial. Okay. And that was uh, bought from a company called Nano Avionics. Mm. And, but the uh, payload instruments that are uh, in, uh, integrated within the satellite uh, are uh, SGO instruments. Okay. So those are, they are scientific instruments which uh, support our scientific activities that we do on this campus uh, related to uh, geophysical phenomena. Mm. And they are designed and built by us. And yeah. they will be finalized here in these facilities. Yeah. And let me ask still, why is it important that it's a clean room, like where you can get any, contam any... Any contamination in space is problematic. Uh, dust particles, they are uh, problematic because of static charges, for example. And uh, one thing you can see here uh, on, on that, in that corner, that is our brand new uh, soldering uh, oven. When you build electronics and you solder the components on, on the uh, PCB, the, the circuit board, well, you usually use <coughs> equipment like this, so soldering iron. Yeah. But then yeah. Uh, when you make them, when you make larger batches and you want to have high quality, then you use an oven. So basically you, you use a paste on, on the board where you stick those components and then uh, you put them in this uh, very specially designed oven where which uh, then melts the paste and basically does the soldering for you uh, okay. and uh, there are reasons to do that uh, in, in overall you you can reach uh, a higher higher levels of quality with this one on the other side of the corridor we have something something uh, else that i i okay believe will in the let's start with this thing here so yeah. As the name would perhaps imply, uh, this is um, a vacuum chamber and this is a facility that is used for uh, thermal vacuum tests. Okay. So, so basically you can place some test instruments inside uh -huh. and you can suck uh, a high vacuum there and you can simultaneously uh, cycle the temperature of the instrument that you are testing. And this simulates quite nicely the, the environment that the instrument or satellite would face uh, in uh, uh, Earth orbit in, in space. Yeah. So it's a combination of uh, vacuum and uh, cycling temperature. Yeah. Because typically uh, we're on, on a low Earth orbit, uh, mm -hmm. let's say 600 kilometers uh, above Earth's surface, uh, that satellite uh, during its orbit it's part of, the, part of the time it's in sunlight and then uh, part of the time it's in Earth's shadow. So it's, it's uh, tre temperature will, will uh, uh, vary and that we can, we can test, test, test with this one. Aurora as such uh, is, is a car, it's, it's uh, constructed of several narrow bands uh, in, in, uh, in op optical region. So basically what, what, what happens is, is when, when the particles from solar wind hit uh, the, the Earth's uh, upper atmosphere, mm. they, they will uh, excite certain uh, uh, molecular there, uh, for example nitrogen, and when, when those uh, excited uh, molecular then, then um, 
uh, when when uh, the, the energy is released, it is released in, in, in light. And uh, it's typically like the, the most typical uh, color that you see in, in Aurora is, is green, green, which is uh, 557 nanometers and in, uh, in, in as, uh, as, as wavelength. Yeah. And uh, so the photometer is used to, to measure those very narrow bands. And uh, this circuit board, board here is actually uh, the current version of our Aurora photometer electronics. Uh, it's, it's one of the scientific instruments that are going to space with our satellites. Auroral photometers, typically the ones that are used on ground, they are quite large and they're quite fragile. So they're, they're usually, the, the size is something like this, which is more than our satellite, which yeah. is something like this. And uh, they are also, um, they, their detector units are usually based on photomultiplier tubes, which are uh, complicated, expensive and fragile and and they need a high voltage and you know many many reasons why they are not very uh, nice for satellite use. Mm, yeah, yeah. So basically what, what but we had the idea that we wanted to try if we can miniaturize things yeah. and make them more robust so that we can have an oral photometer that could be placed inside a small satellite and I think we can. We have. We have done that. Yeah. So um, we just saw in the other building uh, how satellites are being built and, and tested, uh, physically speaking. But then, uh, on the computer screen, I will uh, show some of the next steps uh, about how to how to uh, plan for the satellite mission, and then how to how to uh, handle the the operations of the of the, of the satellite. So what you see now on the screen is a very simplified model of the type of satellite that we have built, Lapisat 1, which is a six unit CubeSat with the, uh, deployed solar panels. So the, the gray box here is the satellite frame and uh, the, 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 the blue thin ones are the, the opened uh, solar panels. And what this uh, software is used for, it's, it's used for to estimate the lifetime of the satellite in orbit. It's, it's nowadays um, <clears throat> required that a satellite will uh, end its life in orbit uh, within 25 years in one, one way or another. Yeah, and you have planned how you will end the life of this satellite. Yeah, uh, basically what this, this simulation software does is it calculates how fast it will uh, dispose from the orbit uh, just by natural means. The low Earth orbits, the, the, the LEO orbits as they're called, they're, they're typically some, somewhere between 500 and 650 kilometers. And here we can see that uh, if our starting al altitude uh, for the type of satellite that I just showed is 620 kilometers, then according to the simulation, we are already roughly above the 25 year limit. Okay. So, so basically it should be somewhat lower than that. Uh, also um, here, well, 540, we're still talking about approximately 10 years in orbit, uh, which is probably more than our satellite has a uh, lifetime. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the 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 time that our satellite will survive yeah. in orbit is more per, most probably going to be less than 10 years anyways okay. and then there's another thing so the the overall mission life is one parameter but then uh, I have zoomed this same data a little bit differently here uh, to show the layer between 520 and 540 kilometers and that is, as, I, as I've written here, that is a layer where the Starlink satellites nowadays exist. Which means that this layer is quite uh, heavily crowded. Yeah, it's busy there. And, and uh, therefore, it's also not only how, how long the satellite is going to be up there altogether, but also it's important how long it will stay in this layer. And now when you see these plots, you can see there are big differences. Mm -hmm. Like these ones just like fly through it like that. And then this one is, is hanging around for a long, long time. Yeah, and you don't want to be a long time there with the no. Starlink. So now if we compare to the, the previous one, so 
the green one and, and the purple one look pretty fine here and the green one and the purple one also look pretty fine actually i would say the purple one would be quite optimal so yeah. the purple one goes very through very very fast through the starling layer and it's quite safe to say that it, it will come come down uh before the 25 year and what is the height of the purple line uh, it seems it's 580 kilometers so you would want to put the satellite in 580 kilometers yes uh so the, this is something that is done before the launch this is some, okay. something we, we need to do when we prepare and also when uh when we apply for for licenses to even even uh go yeah uh but then uh once we are in orbit then we would be using something like this so this by the way i, I want to point out that this this software that you see here this is uh, open source software called okay. g predict uh, anyone can can uh, download this on their uh, computer and play with it it's quite fun um so this first of all this can be used to track satellites uh -huh. uh, it shows uh different satellites where they are at at the moment uh, i have right now uh three objects that i'm tracking uh, one of them is iss the international national space station and then i have two small polar satellites uh, SQ-1 and ALDA-1 and uh, the reason I picked those two is that I've, I've, I've been building both of, both of those so they are uh, very very dear to me even <laughs> though they are both already uh, they have uh, reached the, the end of their mission they are not operational anymore but they are they are still up there mm. and now if we take a look what we can see on the screen uh, first of all in the upper left corner there's just the the running time it's now 1308 which is two hours less than here uh, it's typical to use utc time when, mm. when talking about this to have consistency um, then uh, here on the screen you can see a blue dot that is labeled sgo yeah so i so. have i have a uh, that, that that is our ground station. Yeah, well, ground that is station, us here. Yeah, that, that is us here. Uh, we don't have a, a physical ground station here. We have a ground station elsewhere. Uh, but I, I will. I have marked SGO so that we are kind of uh, seeing what we see at the moment. And then we have the three objects that I mentioned: ISS and the and the two satellites. Uh, these shapes around these objects show what the satellite sees. So this is the ground. Uh, footprint that a satellite can see from the orbit okay. and vice versa uh, from this area the satellite can be seen from ground and yeah. when, it's, when it's closer to the orbit uh, I mean the, the, the pole then the shape gets a little funny because the map projection of course is yep. what it is yep. I mean now we see the current situation what's what's up there but then uh, we also want to want to predict what's to come Yep. And we can do that. So, uh, for example, like this. So here on the, on the um, bottom right corner, I have picked SQ-1 as the uh, example satellite. We see a little bit more information about it here. Its current velocity and, and uh, altitude and, and, and whatnot. But then, for example, I can click here and say show next pass. Now what we see on the screen is the next pass that will begin 13.39.48 UTC. So that is, uh, yeah, that's that's the next one, 29 minutes from now. And uh, we can see it on a polar map. So this is how it will look like. Uh, we are here in the center, and then this is the sky, north, east, south, west. So uh, at 13.39, it will emerge there in the northeast it will travel like so and then it will go behind the horizon somewhere in the northwest and as you can see it's it's fairly low pass 
So this is 30 degree elevation, this is 60 degrees, and then uh, here in the middle it would be 90 degrees, which mm. means that it would go right above us. Okay. So this is like uh, less than 15 degrees, exactly. Exact, uh, in fact, we can see it here. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's less than 15 degrees, the maximum elevation. So yeah, if you, a, this would, would not be a very good pass yeah. for, for communication. Uh, would you see if you would be kind of in a forest and there would be trees around? Like yeah, that's, well... That's, on the other hand, that's why ground stations are usually not in the middle of trees. Yeah. Or if they are, then they are on a high yeah. high post. But once once we have our own satellite, then this is what we use to, to know when we can communicate. Mm. So, so when we want to uh, send commands to the satellite, receive data, this is what we need to know. That, yeah, that so you can communicate with it when you have a... Yes direct contact yes. kind of. so and as you can see these are quite fast so this one it's it started it, it's uh uh it rises above horizon at 940 and it vanishes 951 it's okay. 11 minutes so and and it goes like like from there to there so the satellite or the ground station antenna must be tracking it all all the way 